So I'm going to talk about cognition in schizophrenia. Uh, cognition is a very important topic because uh, of many things. Um, one of the reasons is that if you look at what features of schizophrenia, um, most are related to the disabling nature of the illness. Most data points very strongly to cognitive impairments with um, a close second being negative symptoms. So but cognitive, cognitive impairments um, are common in schizophrenia and they are um, lead, a leading contributor to the disabling nature of the illness. Um, if you have somebody who is cognitively impaired who has difficulties with processing speed, um, or with uh, verbal or um, other, other forms of memory, uh, there's a possibility that you may be talking too fast for them to grab all the information they're trying to give them, and also that they might not recall all of this. Uh, this um, can have a negative impact on cognitively demanding psychotherapies, and potentially in some cases with um, the remembering to take remembering to take medicines or to engage in other um, important aspects of treatment. Um, it also is important because this is one of the things that really most matters to people who are affected with the illness, yet this is something that tends to be overlooked in the office visits. Um, and why is it that um, it's, it tends to be overlooked? It may be because we don't have any medications that our FDA has approved for marketing. Keep in mind that the FDA doesn't decide whether, well, the FDA let me rephrase this. Keep in mind that the principal thing that the FDA, when it approves something, is that it approves the manufacturer's marketing activities and claims. So it doesn't mean that because a medicine isn't recognized by the FDA that that medicine is not effective. Um, there can be, in the case, of, say, of metformin, there's a fairly large body of medical literature which clearly points to a consistent signal of efficacy for metformin to reduce weight associated with second-generation antipsychotic drugs, yet, uh, the, so the science is clear, metformin is effective, um, yet it is not FDA approved, and it doesn't mean that metformin is not effective, it means simply that there's been no manufacturer which has spent the millions of dollars required to get the FDA to make uh, a marketing claim approval. So, very important distinction. Uh, we live in a world where I think um, the, this this line is confused. Uh, it's just because the FDA doesn't just because the FDA hasn't approved for marketing doesn't mean it's not effective. Nonetheless, because there is no approval for marketing of any cognition enhancing approach, um, there is no corporate entity out to promote any um, any approach, and this this uh, contributes to the impression that there is not anything available. And potentially because we have so few known tools in the toolbox, um, that may also be related to some reluctance to bring it up. Yet again, this is an important cause of disability and it's something that matters a lot to people who are affected by the illness. Um, much of what I'm gonna be talking about uh, comes from this review article, which is open access. So if you go to the link, um, and the link should be live in the PDFs that you'll be receiving from Jamie after this is done. Uh, you can download a copy of this article yourself. Uh, there will be some others that aren't in this article and I'll have references for those as well. Um, so when we talk about cognition, it's important to understand that cognition is a massively big, uh, it's a big concept. And within, within the concept of cognition, there are many um, subdomains or, or domains of, of um, that, that would be related to the category of cognition. Uh, these are listed, here, here is listed the um, specific elements that the NIH um, through a consensus conference has um, come up as um, key elements in the assessment of cognition and schizophrenia. Uh, NIH spearheaded a project about 10 years ago which led to a uh, thing called the matrix battery. I'm, I'm forgetting the what matrix, M-A-T-R-I-C-S, actually stands for now, but it's an, it's an acronym. Um, and the bottom line is that there was consensus among experts um, after considerable discussion and review that um, not only are these the specific domains that are of interest when doing studies on cognition and schizophrenia, uh, the matrix battery also specifies the, the specific kinds of 
uh, psychological or neuropsychological test tools that can be used to rate the um, rate the performance on these subdomains. Um, also, the recommendation from NIH um, is that going forward, claims about cognitive enhancement should speak to global cognition. So it should be an unweighted average of all these different components. Um, note the last one on this list is called social cognition. Social cognition is especially important to break out because, um, because it has actually essentially not related to other measures of cognition, uh, yet it is very strongly related, as you might expect, to social outcomes. And social outcomes also matter a lot to uh, people with schizophrenia and also as a substantial contributor to the disability from the illness. And when we say social cognition, we're talking about the ability to perceive or interpret emotional stimuli like facial expressions or gestures, um, the ability to infer intention and sort of to operate in the, in the realm of um, affect and social cues. Um, it's also, I think, worthwhile to put in this note, um, if you, that not all schizophrenias are the same. There are probably many schizophrenias. Um, the evidence is pretty clear to my mind that we're looking at at least four different diseases, all with the same name of schizophrenia, and potentially we could be looking at 20 diseases with similar outward-facing symptoms. Um, yet, when we read about schizophrenia research, we read about it in the singular, not the plural. Uh, we read average scores across large populations. Uh, so when you read papers that say cognitive deficits exist within schizophrenia, this does not mean that all people with schizophrenia have cognitive deficits. This says on average, cognitive scores are lower on the population level. But within that population are many subgroups and there are people with schizophrenia who have no discernible cognitive impairment or who may have impairments in only one or two of those numerous domains. On the other hand, there are people that have severe impairments in most of those domains. So it's a very um, heterogeneous category. And I want to mention this because if this winds up on YouTube, uh, which it will, and people are listening in, I don't want to be heard as saying that everybody with schizophrenia has cognitive impairment, because um, that's absolutely not the case. Um, and I think it's important to mention also because when we talk about these global averages and make these um, categorical pronouncements, it can be um, sapping of people's hopes, which I think is unfair, um, especially because these are generalizations um, rather than necessarily um, speaking to specific cases. So with that, sets of introductions out of the way, let's turn to the question, are there any medications which can reliably boost cognition in schizophrenia? And the answer is probably not very much or any at all. Um, in this review paper by Harvey and uh, Bowie, uh, we have reviews, uh, this is a review of reviews of papers that look at various uh, neurotransmitter-based approaches to cognition improvement. And essentially these are all negative studies. Um, so working with, say, the, uh, the Alzheimer-related approach of cognition enhancers, which are based on boosting cholinergic signal, um, they didn't really have anything reliably um, beneficial. And similarly, you know, most of these other receptor types on, on the table have been studied without really any stellar results. There is a potential exception uh, to this general rule and that is the glutamate system. Um, there are some, uh, some studies which suggest that drugs which can interact with glutamate might um, have an ability to improve at least some areas of cognition a little bit. So notice there's nothing outrageously strong about these drugs, uh, but such drugs uh, would include memantine and lamotrigine. Um, there are a handful of studies which point to potential benefits of these but again, relatively weak and um, nothing that is really pound the table recommendation. So unfortunately, um, the answer is not very much with, the answer to the question, can we improve cognition with medicines is at this time, not a whole lot. Uh, we can, however, um, probably do significant benefit by not adding medicines which can reliably impair cognition. And when I'm talking about this, um, there's a potential signal for benzodiazepines, although that's uh, not very strong and there are conflicting data 
Uh, on the other hand, the data are overwhelmingly consistent and very strong in effect size that anticholinergic drugs, which are very frequently prescribed people with schizophrenia, um, can and do uh, Im impair uh, cognition, most notably in the areas of short-term memory, verbal or uh, written uh, or uh, memory forms. And as just one illustration, here's a study in which people with schizophrenia given both antipsychotic drugs and standard doses of anticholinergic drugs to block EPS uh, were simply taken off their anticholinergic drugs. And the y-axis is, is, um, is a cognition battery score and is normalized to z-score, which is essentially another way of saying standard deviation. Um, and you'll see that from baseline or time zero to 12 weeks after discontinuation, the z-score for the overall cognition has risen by about 0.5. Uh, which is a significant amount. If this, if this were, if we're talking about IQ points, uh, moving a moving a Z score by about 0.5 is saying getting about getting about eight IQ points. Um, so I would love to have eight additional IQ points. Um, so my, my point is that um, this is a clinically meaningful uh, improvement. So also in this study, they found that the vast majority of people that were taken off anticholinergic drugs didn't have any. Um, rebound or they, they, they weren't worse for it, or rather their cognition was better for it. Um, anticholinergic drugs, I, I'm, I'm beginning to think, and I'm gonna just say this is a pure personal opinion now, but I'm beginning to think that they should uh, probably be actively discouraged from use in clinical settings. Um, True, they have a role in the reduction of extrapyramidal symptoms like dystonia and tremor, uh, but there are there is a non-anticholinergic option in the form of amantadine, which can be effective. And you can also, in many cases, not give people EPS by simply dosing the drugs um, a bit lower. Um, and uh, another reason why I'm not a big fan of, of benzodiazepine is that um, I, is that I've seen with my own eyes uh, benzodiazepine clearly precipitating manic episodes, and there are data that suggests that um, adding anticholinergics can actively uh, worsen the symptoms of, of well, worsen, worsen general psychopathology in addition to improving, impairing memory. Um, and, and one other, the bottom study, um, suggests that um, although I may lose, um, you know, 0.2, uh, Z-score worth of cognition if I take two milligrams of benzodiazepine, um, a person with schizophrenia is more susceptible to those uh, effects, and so that person may lose 0.8 worth of Z-score on um, cognition. So, um, so to summarize drugs, there's not a lot that we can offer that will boost cognition, but there is a fairly certain way to not impair cognition further um, or to, uh, if a person has normal memory, to not uh, give them memory problems by avoiding the anticholinergic drugs. Um, the best signal for cognitive improvement actually is through cognitive practice. Um, there's a variety of names for this approach. Um, broadly, I think the broadest category is called cognitive remediation or cognitive remediation therapy. Um, cognitive enhancement therapy is one um, and a, a whole bunch of other names, but the general principle is based just purely on uh, drill and practice. So here's a test. Uh, here's a task, do it and repeat it. Um, a lot of these tests can, a lot of these therapies um, use computers to help with that. So you can try to boost processing speed by um, uh, setting a computer to know um, how often you're getting the right answer. Um, and then it will gradually make the task harder. Uh, so basically, um, it's also related to the concept of use it or lose it. So if we um, use, if we, the more we use certain aspects of our cognitive skills, the more likely we are to retain them. And uh, further, when we um, set ourselves to tasks which we currently can't do, but we practice them and become successful, then we actually grow nerve connections that will serve those tasks. So, um, as it is, say, for any of us going to nurse practitioner or medical school, we acquired new skills uh, through practice. Uh, the same thing can be happening in schizophrenia. Uh, we just have to set the initial level of difficulty at the right level and then have a, um, the proper level of 
gradual increments in, in making it more difficult. Uh, but any, you know, the good news is that um, learning, learning can happen. And if we approach it systematically, we can actually improve cognition. Um, it's, the data are pretty clear that um, doing computer, you know, computer-based cognitive tasks in isolation will get you a few points on processing speed improvements or short-term memory improvements or what have you. Uh, but if those are done in isolation, the clinical impact is not really as good as it can be. The ideal system for doing cognitive remediation therapy is to do the cognitive tasks um, and also to make sure that the environment and the social sphere are changed such that the person who's engaged in this learning um, activity will have opportunities in the real world to practice and, uh, and, and acquire new stimuli and responses. Uh, when you do this, the outcomes are actually quite, a, quite impressive, as you'll see in a bit. Uh, one example is when cognitive rehabilitation therapy is combined with vocational rehabilitation therapy, then you see on average that um, it becomes easier to acquire employment, um, to maintain employment, and to make more money in employment. Um, so that would be a great example of um, doing something in the clinical laboratory or the clinical, let's say the cognitive laboratory, um, and combining it with uh, real world laboratory experiences to sort of accelerate the overall um, functional outcome of someone. Um, I'm going to now talk about effect sizes of, the, of, of a couple of strategies. Um, and just to review, effect size is a way, is a statistical measure to allow one to compare apples and oranges, essentially. So, uh, say uh, on the right hand side of this graph, you'll see iloperidone, loracetone, and acenapine. Even though these drugs are not, have not been tested head to head against each other um, by comparing how they perform to placebo and normalizing that in effect size, you can reasonably compare um, the efficacy of the various drugs and by the and the point of this graph most this graph is taken from a clozapine slide so clozapine is highlighted in blue because its effect size is outsized compared to everything else but the point of showing you this graph now is to highlight that the effect size of antipsychotic drugs ranges from 0.4 to 0.6 um, incidentally that range of 0.4 to 0.6 is pretty much on par with the effect size of serotonin reuptake inhibitors for the treatment of depression so many of our psychotropic medications um, with no effectiveness and FDA approval um, have effect sizes of we'll say ballpark 0.5. Um, what is the effect size of cognitive remediation therapy? Pretty much on par with antipsychotic drugs. Um, based upon a very large meta-analysis from 2011, um, the effect size was estimated to be 0.45. So right in line, whoops, right in line with um, with all the drugs in the gray or black bars. Uh, pretty, actually pretty good. Um, and further, um, cognitive remediation therapy also appears to impact negative symptoms uh, with effect size ranging from 0.3 to 0.4. Interestingly, in this meta-analysis, um, the meta-analyzers or the authors, investigators, commented that when studies were, when, when you just break out the studies with higher levels of rigor, um, that's actually the ones that generated the effect size of 0.4. So 0.4 is a good effect size, and not to beat up on iloperidone, loracetone, acenapine, or zeprasidone, but on par with, with a lot of those agents. Um, aerobic exercise, um, overall, on all cognitive domains, um, 0.4 to 0.5. Um, and interestingly, when the... Um, breaking out the studies in which people were assigned personal trainers or fitness professionals, um, you had stronger effect size. And so also when the um, intensity or the frequency or the duration of the aerobic exercise was increased, there was a tendency toward increasing the effect size of the results. So exercise appears to work. And um, the bottom bullet points on the attention vigilance sub subdomain, 0.7 or 0.66, um, and social cognition, that thing that is highly related to bad outcomes, 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is actually very, um, compared to everything else we have in the arsenal, is actually a pretty large effect size um, versus the antipsychotic drugs. So um, to summarize then, 
um, cognitive declines on average are present in schizophrenia, although within the average are many, many variations. And so some people will have minimal effect and some people more effect on cognition as a result mm -hmm. of illness. Um, it is difficult to find, uh, to point to drugs that can reliably boost cognition, although it's quite easy to find one class of drugs, the anticholinergics, that can reliably impair cognition. So pharmacologically, we can try to help our patients by avoiding exposure to those kinds of medicines. Um, and both cognitive remediation therapy and exercise are safe. They have no significant serious adverse effects, um, and they're effective. Uh, thus, uh, we 